Uh, welcome to the 2013 CANSI Conference. Give yourselves a hand. Uh, my name is Andreas Link. Um, I studied here. Um, I'm a, a, a team lead in the economics unit at the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario. Um, I used to call myself a, a species at risk economist. I save animals with numbers. I think um, we need ec an economics that helps protect the planet. Um, to economize something usually meant to, to, to make good use of it, yet uh, currently uh, we, a lot of the uh, current economic paradigm deals with liquidation economics, trying to get rid of the natural resources as quickly as possible. So um, the theme uh, of uh, the conference at uh, York University is uh, sustaining the commons. Uh, ideas and Actions for a uh, Green Economy. And it draws from uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work on polycentrism, uh, acknowledging the potential of collaboration and cooperation to solve common uh, resource problems. So energy, uh, carbon emissions, uh, watershed management. Uh, we, uh, humans have shown the propensity to solve problems using cooperation and collaboration. And uh, I hope uh, with the conference, we're bringing together many different disciplines, speakers. Um, I, I just ran into uh, the plenary speaker, uh, Alan Richardson, this morning, who, who's an accountant. Uh, we need people from every discipline to solve uh, the current environmental uh, problems that, that, are, that face us. Um, and, and there's plenty of evidence in, in, in many areas uh, of, of the real challenges that we have before us. So um, I, uh, one thing about CANSI is uh, ecological economics is a field that proposes alternative ways of uh, understanding a relationship between the economy, society, natural ecosystems. It gives us the opportunity to understand the very integrated and interwoven nature of ecosystem societies and economies, to envision new ways in which the spheres might interact so as to engender sustainable and just relationships among humans uh, and uh, between them and the non-human. So, uh, again, we, we need to try to focus on these solutions, ideas from scholarship, but also we have folks, um, again, I'm coming from government, uh, government's not always seen as the answer, but uh, I think a lot of environmental problems deal with uh, public goods that we need to protect, uh, and uh, tomorrow the plenaries will be talking about sustainable business, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of debate um, on, on either side of things. I want to give uh, uh, thanks to a number of people. First off, um, the sponsors, uh, York University, the Faculty of Environmental Studies. We um, uh, met with the Dean uh, about a year ago, and, uh, and uh, the FES has always been very supportive of both ecological economics and CANSI, and uh, we now have an office and a, a small secretariat to trying to engender the study of economics. Um, the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada. We were given support to uh, the Ivy Foundation. Uh, we have a plenary um, uh, that on uh, uh, the last day that uh, will discuss um, fiscal, uh, ecological uh, fiscal measures. Uh, and the C.D. Howe Institute economists um, we will debate uh, sustainable pro prosperity economists. Uh, so we're going to kind of get, again, not just the, the folks that are on side, not just a self-selection of the same environmentalists that, that, that hash these same ideas. We want to try to bring in new people into the fold uh, to debate the ideas, to try to get at uh, a, a larger consensus amongst uh, uh, the population. Silver uh, Partners, David Suzuki Foundation, Green Analytics, um, the Metcalf Foundation, International Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, Blue Green Canada, uh, and uh, the Broadbent Institute. A number of these folks will be um, uh, either chairing sessions or uh, giving um, uh, talks of their own, uh, but we definitely appreciate that support. Um, uh, also, I want to thank uh, Peter Victor, uh, Ellie Perkins, uh, Christina Hoika, um, who uh, were all signatories to the, uh, the research grant. Um, a special mention to Christina Hoika, the PowerStream Chair in uh, Sustainable Energy Economics, 
uh, who a lot of our uh, volunteers uh, here because of the enthusiasm that uh, she displayed for uh, the conference. Uh, I think what's great about the conference is that we're having a, all kinds of uh, demographics. Uh, uh, we realize that there's a, a, a real problem. That's not just uh, a certain movement in the universities, but it's uh, throughout all different age groups. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce uh, the FES Dean. Uh, Noel Sturgeon is the Dean for um, uh, uh, and professor in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University in Toronto. She uh, is the author, author of uh, Eco-Feminist Natures, Race, Gender, Feminist Theory and Political Action, Environmentalism in Popular Culture, Gender, Race, Sexuality and the Politics of uh, the Natural, and numerous articles on environmentalism, anti-militarism, militarist and feminist movements and theories. She has been a distinguished Fulbright lecturer at York, and a Rockefeller uh, fellow at uh, the Center for Critical uh, Analysis and Contemporary Culture at Rutgers, and a visiting scholar at uh, the Murdoch Institute in Australia, G JFK Institute, and uh, Freie Universität uh, in Berlin, the Center of Cultural Studies at US uh, UCSC and universities in Taiwan, China, Japan, and Ukraine. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce someone of such distinction. Uh, we have uh, three, uh, two great plenaries uh, for you um, uh, coming up. So I, I will introduce, if you can give a hand to uh, Dean Noel Sturgeon, please. All right. Thanks very much. Um, I really uh, am pleased to be asked to welcome you all to the CANSEE conference. I'm very proud of the fact that um, we have so many wonderful students of ours who have been doing such a great job of organizing this conference. Andreas, of course, um, Ed Crummy, Brad Dalter, Lisa Nagy, Eric Miller. Uh, these are, are I think a prime example of the importance of the kind of work we do at the Faculty of Environmental Studies is the active and smart way in which um, these folks have been organizing this conference. I also want to mention and thank the staff member in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, our research officer, Rhoda Reyes, who I think helped quite a bit with the organization of this conference. And then, of course, as Andreas has mentioned, our partners and sponsors, and the um, faculty sponsors and organizers, Peter Victor, Ellie Perkins, and Christina Hoika. Uh, uh, Andreas mentioned that Christina Hoika, who has just joined us this year as our power stream chair in sustainable energy economics, is we're really delighted to have her here, and she is bringing something to this faculty that is very important, and I think also to this group of people. And I want to point out the brochure on the sustainable energy initiative that's going to be on the table. And please pick that up and uh, take a look at what we're doing there. Um, being the dean of, of the Faculty of Environmental Studies is a very, very interesting job, as you might imagine. It's, it's such an interdisciplinary program. The students are very lively. It's a very dynamic um, arena. We are the uh, first Faculty of Environmental Studies in Canada. We're the most interdisciplinary um, college or Faculty of Environmental Studies in the world, I believe. Uh, we also have an extremely large master's program which contains within it the largest graduate planning program in Canada and I'm very very proud of that because what that means is that we have people going out who are certified planners who are also trained in things like uh, e ecological economics, um, critical cultural practice, all kinds of things that mean that I'm hoping that there'll be this further this slow revolution that we need uh, in this country and in the world as people go in and change institutions from the ins inside. Um, let me say a little bit about um, ecological economics. It's not exactly my field, but I think it's incredibly important um, to have this kind of field and to have this kind of conference and to have this work be gains more prominence. I think we're thankfully moving past a time when environmentalism versus jobs was the popular paradigm, when these two were seen as incompatible. We have a booming so-called green economy that's growing. It's clear that what's behind that is that environmental problems have, or it's recognized that environmental problems have serious economic consequences. And when you see um, relatively conserved entities like insurance companies and governments worried about climate change, although many of them are still in denial, um, when, they, when things like weather volatility, health effects from toxins in food, air, and water, energy costs from reliance on non-renewables all have uh, 
measurable serious economic consequences, it's an important time to be making the kinds of arguments and doing the kinds of work that you all are doing. This booming green economy, however, provides an opening in which um, environmental arguments can be heard if they, be shown, if they are shown to be addressing challenges to corporate bottom lines. But we must move beyond the straitjacket of profit versus loss, cost-benefit analyses that do not fundamentally change the structures which cause and maintain environmental devastation and social inequality. Ecological economics moves us beyond these structures. It challenges us to think beyond the dualism that naturalized the hegemony of the 1%. As though, and challenges us to think beyond the divides between natural dynamics and social life, between so-called scientific objectivity and values, between home and the domestic and the private and the economy and the public. These divides prevent us from creating an economy based on what environmental feminist philosopher Chris Cuomo calls flourishing, where we're well-being, creativity, care, community, and environmental justice are our touchstones for a lively, open, and sustainable economy. Take this conference seriously, for the work you are doing here is essential to the transformation that we all wish for, and I thank you for your passion and your dedication to this work. Thanks very much, Dean Sturgeon. All right, so, I'll introduce uh, Ellie Perkins. Pat uh, Patricia Ellie Perkins <laughs> uh, is a professor at the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, where she teaches in the areas of ecological economics, community economic development, and critical interdisciplinary research design. Her research focuses on feminist ecological economics, uh, climate justice, and participatory uh, uh, community and watershed-based ba uh, environmental education for political engagement. She directed international research projects on community-based environmental and watershed education in Brazil and Canada, and on climate justice and equity in watershed management with partners in Mozambique, South Africa, and Kenya. She's on the advisory board for uh, the Green Change Project, focusing on green community development in Toronto. Previously, she taught economics at Eduardo uh, Mundlan uh, University in Maputo, Mozambique. She holds a PhD in economics at the University of Toronto. Uh, uh, she uh, has brought her, her talk uh, specifically related to the idea of the commons. So I, I'm v very much looking forward to the plenary talk that uh, Ellie has for us today. So give her a, a big round of applause. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming to this to this important meeting. Um, as I was doing the research for this presentation, uh, I became more and more impressed by Canada's history with regard to the commons. And it, it's, made, it's made me realize that we actually have a responsibility here in Canada and as ecological economists in Canada to build on our strong traditions and our in, large potential, it seems to me, to advance ideas of commons, um, both locally and regionally and globally. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about in, in, in the time that I have is how we define this term of commons, why it's important for ecological economics, and why governance is crucial in uh, the global situation where, that we're in now. I want to give some Canadian examples of commons in practice and suggest some ways that we as ecological econ economists in academia, policy and activism can foster commons growth and regrowth. But before I do that, how do I advance things here? Before I do that, okay, so that's my general outline. First, as a, set, though, before, as a settler and as an immigrant here, myself, because I was born in the U.S., um, I want to thank and acknowledge the First Nations of the territories where we're meeting. The Anishinaabe Mississauga, the Seneca, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. Um, and I want to give you some local context. And I'm doing this for uh, a reason that has to do with kind of modeling the, the kind of approach that I think we need to take if we're going to be developing commons. Um, you may not know that the river that we now call the Humber, which is just west of here, 
this river here, was uh, an important uh, canoe transport link with Georgian Bay and all of northern Ontario, as you can see in this map. Um, there was a large village on the banks of Black Creek, which, is, which runs through the York University campus, and uh, it, right now it's under where there are um, hydro lines and pipelines, which means that the remains of that village are still there. They haven't been um, dug up for high-rise basements and things like that. Uh, the portages to Lake Simcoe through the Humber and uh, the Holland River here, you can see there's just a little short distance, and it, it avoids you having to go all the way around Lake, Lake Erie and uh, to, to get to, to Georgian Bay in northern Ontario, there's a very neat shortcut right there. So. Um, there was uh, the, the portages began, and that's one of the reasons why Toronto became known as the meeting place, because people there was a, a lot of, tra of travel through here. And I just would like to also say that Aboriginal tra traditions of hospitality and sharing potlatch, potlatch, which is giving away material wealth in order to demonstrate moral and community standing, so it's a way of trading off material wealth and social position in, in a very interesting. Um, model of income redistribution, uh, which is sustainable over time. Also humility, reverence for the earth and its creatures and life systems. These things are all central to the ideas of locally appropriate commons governance processes that we're going to be talking about over the next few days at this conference. And also First Nations in, in North America had nested systems of governance with uh, confederacies and um, local leaders relating to larger scale leaders and, 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 and systems for, for conflict resolution over progressively larger uh, geographic levels that are e exactly the kind that Eleanor Ostrom has cited as successful ways to, to govern large scale commons. So these are some of the things that occurred to me and that I learned about as I was researching for this paper and um, so I think that it's a very it's very interesting when you use this commons paradigm and explore your own um, local situation and local problems that you might be uh, experiencing or, or knowing about at the local level so in in recent work on oh I just wanted to show this too this is a map from the 1660s showing this that same area with um, the rivers at the north of uh, the, the western end of Lake Ontario going up to Georgian Bay. And this map from the 1660s actually mentions two native villages, Tayayagan, and um, the other one is Kanachtikwayagan, which is on the Rouge River, just, uh, just east of Toronto. Um, and this is a picture of, of Potlatch. It's actually from the late 1800s in um, Washington State, but as we know, potlatches were a tradition all up the western coast of North America, where goods were given away, and um, that was a, a, an important mechanism of in income re redistribution. Uh, Bill Reese talked about the importance of that last night. So, in in recent work on commons, um, on ecological economics, on degrowth, on the transition to more sustainable socioeconomic systems. Um, the commons is a paradigm for future economic institutions. And this goes beyond the idea of a commons as a common property regime with socio-political structures required to prevent open access. The vision more broadly of a commons is one of people working together cooperatively to build methods of production, service prov provision, and exchange which create value and well-being while integrating ecological care, justice, and long-term planning to the best of uh, the di diverse community's abilities. And so it, uh, uh, the commons, viewed more broadly, includes institutions such as co-ops, land trusts, and any non-market or beyond-market collective way of organizing production, distribution, consumption, and waste management. 
And I guess I don't have to tell this audience that uh, preventing the so-called tragedy of the commons by controlling open access through strong social institutions um, requires a high level of general civic consciousness, of cooperation, the ability to listen and mediate different goals, conflict resolution, flexibility, and goodwill throughout society, especially in the context of social dynamism and diversity. And that's a big mouthful, right? Um, especially when you have uh, societies that, are, that, that ha contain within them a lot of diversity and the potential for difference if there isn't a foundation of goodwill, of listening, of respect, you, it's, a, it's a recipe for a lot of problems. But if there is that kind of a foundation that, that, that permeates the society, then the diversity itself becomes a real um, uh, area of strength for the, for the whole group because there are people who have all kinds of different experiences and knowledges that can be brought together potentially. So Eleanor Ostrom has demonstrated through meticulous research that this doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen that people can communicate and build sustainable uh, cooperative institutions, but it is possible. And her research has focused on what are the conditions under which this kind of serendip serendipitous outcome takes place. Uh, I'd just like to say that there is a long history of ideas about commons. The Interdisciplinary International Association for the Study of the Commons was formed in 1989, which I think is the very same year that the International Society for Ecological Economics was formed, and the Canadian Society as well, right around those, the late 80s there. I ask now has over a thousand institutional members. Oops, I needed to advance this. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, IASC has a thousand institutional members or more than that and has sponsored 12 international conferences with the most recent in Japan in June 2013. Commons is a big subject in Japan. There are, there are new books uh, coming out and articles all the time from Japan about this and I think it's very interesting um, the, 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 the contributions that they are making to the literature on this. Um, the, the next IASC conference is planned for May 2015 in Alberta. There are regional meetings, an online digest, a digital library, bibliographies, and discussion groups all on there linked through their website. Um, and new books on commons appear every week. Uh, it's just amazing how much how, how vibrant this area of study is. The idea that commons governance represents an alternative to the market or the state is becoming well known and widely accepted. And I think these three governance options, market, state, and commons, seem to be part of moving, moving towards greener, more sustainable eco economies everywhere. So I think we need to, to just kind of expand our minds and think about the potential of commons in, in, in connection with these other kinds of, of ways of organizing um, economic activity. So what exactly is a commons? The word is a kind of an odd collective noun. It's pluralized, but it's singular. How do we understand this idea? There's a risk um, which has been noted in, in the literature, and especially the literature that's critical of the idea of commons, that it'll become the latest glom on term, co-opted, vague, that it'll, it'll end up obscuring more than it conveys. But, and I think that this is always a risk with any kind of a new idea. Things <laughs> tend to get co-opted. But I like the idea of commons as starting uh, from a place like um, ownership and property, land, resources, assets that are explicitly not privately owned. In, in that sense, commons has a little bit more of a, of, of a centrality to it than other um, co-opted terms like sustainability or development. Commons is about who owns stuff and who manages it and, and how that happens. And it expresses in the COM part, at least, um, that, it, that that needs to happen jointly, and that it's about resources that are jointly owned. So Commons takes a big step towards internalizing externalities, um, which is one of our big critiques, of course, of neoclassical economics that ex external and capitalism that external out externalities keep getting generated, and that the incentives within the system are to generate more and more externalities. Commons is takes a different approach. It's it it focuses on uh, the communications process, another COM word, right? The and community, another COM word. It it it, it focuses on 
how people can use discourse and communication, another C-O-M word, I guess, to, uh, to build, um, uh, to bring politics together with economics, to value ecological and social goods and services collectively, to, um, to build on some of the traditions of political ecology and feminist ecological economics um, in, in doing this. A recent book on commons and ecological governance says the commons is a term that applies to the resources utilized, owned, or shared by multiple individuals on a group basis. That's a Japanese book that came out this year. The traditional commons had to do with the management of resources on a local, not global level. Those resources were not comprehensible if removed from the micro-societal context in which they existed. Current day widespread use has diluted the formerly, formerly rigorous definition of the term commons, transformed it into a word with exceedingly mundane connotations, and fostered a vast expansion in the scope of those resources now considered worthy of research within a commons related context. And then they say, this, this book, their, their book, this Japanese book that came out last year, I think it's the, the purple one, um, three down there in the stack. This volume re rests on the perspective that modern society is composed of three elements, a public sector, common sector, and private sector. If humanity were a society driven by the profit motive alone, it would be a society of disparities highlighted by unbearable levels of inequity. That is why society demands the existence of a public sector committed to the redistribution or balancing of income and assets through the power of taxation. Modern societies also incorporate a common sector that is neither public nor private, that operates independently of the profit motive or the interest in upholding, upholding public authority. Structures or communities of this nature are typically composed of households various cooperatives or nonprofit organizations, and international volunteer associations. Cooperation and, and or coordination are the driving principles which, on which these organizations operate. I read that some, somewhat extensive quote because I, I like the way it contextualizes the need for us to really pay attention to commons because of the shortcomings that have been, um, that we are witnessing with purely market and countered by state uh, intervention. The state, in other words, doesn't have uh, the ability to bring a market-oriented economic system into line and, and make it a sustainable one and one that really meets society's needs. Something else is required. And that's why, that, that's what these Japanese authors are saying, commons, commons uh, needs to supply. So Eleanor Ostrom's uh, definition, when, in her book with Charlotte Hess on, uh, on, int on intellectual property commons and, and information commons, they define the term as, uh, commons is a general term that refers to a resource shared by a group of people. Pretty simple. A resource shared by a group of people. In a commons, the resource can be small and serve a tiny group, the family refrigerator. It can be community level, sidewalks, playgrounds, libraries, and so on. Or it can extend to international and global levels, deep seas, the atmosphere, the internet, and scientific knowledge. The commons can be well-founded, a community park or library, transboundary, the Danube River, migrating wildlife, the internet, or without clear boundaries, knowledge, the ozone layer. So, you know, it's, let me just give you one more definition, let's see. Um, there's, a, there's a recent book that was uh, somewhere down in that stack, a multicolored book, uh, by Bollier and Weston. They use the following definition. A commons is a regime for managing common pool resources that eschews individual property rights and state control. It relies instead on common property arrangements that tend to be self-organized and enforced in complex, idiosyncratic ways. So I'll skip uh, the other definitions that I've got here, but you get the general idea. Giovanna Riccoveri, I can, I'll let you read that if you want to. She's, she's a, an Italian um, ecological economist who's, who's written a book also that came out last year, or this year, on uh, commons and nature. I would just like to say that uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work emphasizes the importance of locally constructed governance processes, local monitoring and enforcement of environmental quality and access to the resource. This is where she says the efficiencies and the advantages of commons management lie because local people have the, the foundational knowledge and also the ability to monitor access and resource use issues because they are there, they're in situ. They, they can do 
it with a, a lot more cheaply and efficiently than government um, monitoring agencies can. So there's a long history of this idea in, uh, as I've said, in, in non-Western traditions and also in the West. The ancient Rome uh, Justinian Code of 534 the year 534, so divided everything into res private, res publicae, res communes, and res nullius. Right? It was either not occupied, occupied communally, privately owned, or publicly owned. Right? So we have, this is kind of in our, in our traditions, whether we <laughs> realize it or not. Um, and res communes in the Justinian Code referred to earth, water, air, sky, flora and fauna, and navigable waterways. So that's kind of interesting. There, we know in the, um, in the English uh, and UK history, there was the um, uh, common, common land for grazing the commons in the centers of towns where sheep could graze. Um, the, tr the, the commons were divided up uh, as part of the rise of the gentry in um, what, 1600s, 1700s in, in, the, in England. And so there, there are long histories of these kinds of ideas and what happened to them. Kropotkin talked about mutual aid. We have uh, the, the, the growth of guilds and, and leading into worker cooperatives, leading into trade unions, and the idea of housing cooperatives and people generating, you know, building barns together. And there are so many things that we can talk about as leading into this idea. But, you know, it, this is, you, you could easily teach a course on this, let me just say. <laughs> There's a lot that, that could be put together in a very interesting course on commons. So I'd like to go now to some examples in Canada. Um, in, in Canada, the first co-ops developed, uh, the first known cooperative uh, consumer co-op developed in uh, Nova Scotia in 1864. A cooperative bank was founded at Rustico, Prince Edward Island, also in 1864. There were worker cooperatives connected with the Knights of Labor in the 1880s. And Canada still has the highest per capita credit union membership in the world. 35% um, of Canadians are credit union members. According to the Canadian Cooperative Association, there are approximately 9,000 cooperatives and credit unions in Canada which provide products and services to 18 million members in all economic sectors, agriculture, re retail, financial services, housing, childcare, renewable energy, etc. They have more than $370 billion in member-owned assets. They employ 150,000 people. They have strong links with their local communities via volunteer volunteerism, community donations, and sponsorships. The survival rate of cooperatives is higher than that of traditional businesses. 62% are still operating after five years, compared with 35% for traditional businesses. And after 10 years, the figures are 44% and 20% respectively. So the co-ops that survive tend to be long-lived, and it, it's probably related to their community roots. Um, there's a really interesting uh, history of co-ops in Canada that's available online. It was written by an emeritus professor at the University of Victoria, history professor named Ian McPherson. So if you're interested in this Canadian history, I encourage you to look, look for that. Um, I've been teaching uh, community development for quite a while, and I ha was always amazed that there wasn't a really good um, sort of history of, of how cooperative and community development evolved in Canada. And I'm glad that uh, Ian McPherson has now written one. Uh, he points out a number of interesting things about the development of co-ops in Canada. How much time? I better not say that. Look at the, look at the article. He's, he, he, he does some interesting analysis of why, why it is that co-ops developed in Canada. So I just want to mention um, a local, a regional, and a transboundary commons um, as, as a few examples of the kinds of things that exist in Canada. Not far from the tree is an organization in Toronto that was started by an FES graduate, uh, Laura Rainsborough, a few years ago. They put, they, they, um, they org it's, it's organized online. When somebody has a fruit tree in their backyard or their front yard or they know about a fr fruit tree in a local park where the, the fruit is going to waste, they call Not Far From The Tree and Not Far From The Tree organizes volunteers to come and pick the fruit. 
the tree owner gets a third, the volunteers who pick it get a third, and a third goes to local food banks. So um, this is also already leading to spin-offs around um, food processing and uh, you know jam making and collective kitchen use and all kinds of you know you can see how how the spin-offs can develop from this kind of a thing. It's a small scale initiative, but it demonstrates how you can you can build these institutions that link perhaps seniors who are no longer able to climb their apple tree or you know don't want to get a pole out and knock the pears down or whatever with young people who live in the community or people who live in apartments nearby who are you know hungry for that kind of uh, of an outdoor experience in the city and then social connections develop and it's and and it can be the beginning of a of a process of community building uh, I want to mention another one, another Canadian example, which is the Bruce Trail. I know about this because Daisaku Shimada, who was a postdoctoral student here, um, adopted this as his study. He came here interested in commons, and he decided to do some research on how the Bruce Trail developed. And it's a, it, it goes uh, for 885 kilometers from Tobermory, Ontario, up in the little point that sticks up towards Manitoulin Island, down to Queenston, uh, which is uh, beyond Niagara Falls, along the Niagara Escarpment, which is a UNESCO heritage preserve. And anybody who wants to can walk along that trail. It crosses private property, it crosses parks and government property, partly it's on um, roads and public, you know, public rights of way, but much of it isn't. And the volunteers of the Bruce Trail Conserva 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 Conservancy uh, uh, approached all of the private landowners that, ha that had land at, at the top edge of the escarpment, and through their, what is it, kind permission, they, they sort of elicited <laughs> kind permission of the landowners to allow people to use the trail. And partly they had to do this by saying, this is not about eminent domain. We're not going to take your land. We're not even going to put it, it, put it in any kind of an institutional process that threatens your uh, ownership of this land. We just want to use it. And so that, that fits in with traditions in Scandinavia and uh, other um, and places in the UK where uh, there is a public right of access, and sometimes, like in Germany, you can harvest mushrooms and berries, I think in Scandinavia too. People have the right to go, even if they don't really own the land. So it's kind of a multiplicity of ownership and use um, possibilities, which can arise with, with these kinds of discussions. The third one that I just want to mention is the Baja to Bering Corridor, which, I mean, I think it, it builds on the same kinds of ideas that um, were used in building the Bruce Trail. The Baja to Bering Corridor is something that's being advocated by the Marine Conservation Institute to link areas of biodiversity species conservation it off the coast of North America, from Alaska and can northern Canada down to Mexico. And they're working with government officials, activists, and conservation associations to make this known, to try to get people communicating about it, and to build a commons, a marine commons, a transboundary marine commons. So there are all sorts of examples of this being revived and, uh, and brought into practice. So now, what are some of the characteristics of the cases that have been successful? Eleanor Ostrom's work um, has identified several. The uh, successful commons governance uh, examples that she uh, has researched, and it's just amazing the, uh, the detail in, in the books and uh, the work of her institute there in Indiana. But she said they face uncertain and complex environments, so they're not easily governed in other ways. The local population is stable over long periods of time. People care about their reputations, and they expect their descendants to inherit the land and to, to be living there too in a hundred more years. Um, norms have evolved, social norms and economic and you know, use norms have evolved which allow individuals to live in close inter interdependence with each other. So there aren't um, gross, uh, severe social divisions. And the resource systems and institutions have persisted over time. They're robust and they're sustainable.
And uh, this last point is, I think, the weak link and, and the reason why um, many traditional, long, long-standing commons governance institutions fell at the time of colonialism or when there was invasion by somebody else. Because when a, when a higher authority comes and says, oh, no, 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 you can't do it this way. That, that's one of the, uh, of the weak links in the system that Eleanor Ostrom has identified. Um, so we need to kind of pay attention to that, recognize that, and, and, and realize that, that if a commons is a legitimate way of governing something, then maybe we should respect it if we see one in practice. Ostrom developed a set of uh, what she calls design principles, which is really um, <clears throat> Also, descriptions of the way successful commons governance uh, institutions operate. They have clearly defined boundaries. There's congruence between appropriation and provision rules and local conditions. That means there's the, the, whatever the rules are, they're locally appropriate. There are collective choice arrangements, which she calls, uh, which means individuals can participate in modifying the rules. So there is, um, they're democratic, basically. Monitoring takes place by the, by the members, mem the people who have uh, a stake in, you could say a stake, I don't like the word stake very much because it's, it seems kind of like, mm. but uh, the people who are members of the commons have, uh, have the ability to monitor and, and keep track of what's going on. There are graduated sanctions for violations of rules. There's rapid low cost conflict resolution. Um, there are mechanisms for that. And there is uh, a recognition of, of the rights to organize by the outside authorities. That again is that outside authorities don't uh, interfere in what local people are doing. And for larger systems, Ostrom said, there are multiple layers of nested enterprises which perform governance functions. So, um, no, that's the end of what I was saying, the nested layers. So what are the attributes and skills required in the general populace for commons to be managed well and for this paradigm and framework to spread? I'm, I'm not talking about a wholesale in substitution of commons types, goods and service provision for everything that's done by the market at once, but I see this as an, 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 an inexorable progress. Sorry, it's it's happening. You know, it's, there's a there's a transformation that's going on in society, and um, I think that commons can can gradually expand to meet new needs and to meet the many gaps in the global and local economy because commons are more flexible institutions than anything else, and they are appropriate in many situations. Interesting ideas about skills generation and transmission for commons comes come not just from ecological economics, but from such a range of fields including community development, systems theory, whole psychology, philosophy, ecofeminism. I'm sure all of, all of you in this room will have some ideas about how this can arise and how it relates to your, to your own work. Global scholar, water scholar uh, Ken Konka um, talks about how scholarship on uh, institutions for global water governance shows the importance of, of um, institutions that facilitate dispute resolution and communication am among many, many people that are concerned in the watershed. Um, he talks about this as second order public goods to facilitate the nurturing of new institutions. And um, he links this to peacemaking, cooperative knowledge ventures, the emergence of regional scale identities and, and watershed identities so that people re recognize what watershed they're part of and how their own life and subsistence is related to that of other people who live within the region. The, uh, the book that I mentioned earlier by Bollier and Weston talks about innovations in law and policy being needed in three particular areas. Let's see if I've got this. Um, no, I didn't write these up on slides because I don't like slides with words. Okay, they said general in internal governance principles and policies for commons are needed. This is something that legal, legal scholars can work on along with perhaps ecological economists. Also macro principles and policies that the state and the market can embrace to develop commons and peer governance. And the third one is catalytic legal strategies to validate, protect, and support commons. Um, so I need to wind up, um, but I'd just like to say that um, it seems to me that there are 
four, four, four methods uh, that we can support this as ecological economists occurred to me. And as I said, I, I, I bet that, that many people will have other ideas as well. But we can spread this knowledge of commons. We can develop new courses. We can talk about the work of Ostrom and others. We can read the books that are coming out about this and think about how this third way, not the market, not the state, might be a solution in particular um, situations that we know about. We can also do, do research and analyzing the perverse subsidies and the barriers to commons governance models that exist now out there. And we can um, provide information to policymakers and work for their removal. We can also demonstrate discourse-based collective valuation processes to build local democracy and responsibility and local community-based environmental education to help people realize how they are part of a uh, of an interdependent local ecosystem. We can also assist new co-ops co and co commons governance initiatives through business plans to support their growth and through other kind of knowledge of economic policy and of economic, existing economic institutions to help new co-ops get going. And I'm sure you all have other ideas. So um, I believe that we'll uh, just uh, have discussion at the end after Andrea's talk about all of this in order to make this uh, a fairer way of, of dividing the, the time. Thank you very much.